for the last couple of days, we, we had quite a few um, really excellent technical and application talks of deep learning uh, in the medical setting. Um, but one thing that we haven't heard so much is about the clinical perspective, about data collection, data cleaning, labeling, integrating tools into clinical workflows, actually answering uh, appropriate clinical questions, and integrating some of the decisions that are being made by algorithms into clinical workflows. And in my opinion, at least, there's really no better person in the UK to talk about these kind of problems. So Pierce Keen, who's our keynote speaker today, uh, is an MD and a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. He's also a consultant uh, ophthalmologist at the Morfields Eye Hospital, which, if you don't know, is the largest worldwide uh, specialist high care hospital in the world. And he's also a clinical scientist at the Institute of Ophthalmology at UCL. Um, Pierce's research really focuses on applied ophthalmology research uh, and has a particular interest in imaging and new technologies. And in 2016, uh, he started a collaboration with DeepMind, where they've been looking into OCT image analysis and automated diagnosis. And as part of this project, they, they had a very recent publication in Nature Medicine, where they published a deep learning algorithm that was able to detect uh, 50 different eye conditions with a really high level of accuracy, actually supplanting many of the world experts. So without further ado, I would like to let you, let Pierce tell you more about this. <clears throat> Um, thank, thank you, uh, George, for the kind introduction. And uh, th you know, uh, it's really a great honor to come and speak here. And thanks to Ben and Tom and George for inviting me to speak, and 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 hopefully try and give you a clinical uh, perspective. Um, I don't know if everybody will be able to read the blue writing there, but it's pierce.keen1 at nhs.net. If anybody wants to uh, contact me with any questions about the talk, um, and as George has said. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to speak about the collaboration uh, between Moorfields Eye Hospital and between uh, and with DeepMind. <clears throat> and um, what I'm going to try to convince you, if you didn't know this already, is that ophthalmology is the best medical specialty and will be the first medical specialty to be fundamentally transformed by some of the recent advances in deep learning and medical image analysis and the like. <clears throat> Um, these are, this is my disclosure. I think the most important disclosure to say is that I do act as a paid consultant uh, for DeepMind, so I do have a financial bias. So please do bear that in mind if I get overly enthusiastic and excited over the next uh, hour or so. <clears throat> so um, before we get into the good stuff, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about um, what it means to examine the eye. And, um, my whole career, uh, or my, my life for the past 10 or more years, has been looking at the eye, <clears throat> and not just looking at the front of the eye like you see here, but looking at just one part of the eye. So I like to look through the pupil, through this, this sort of keyhole into this dark cave, which is the back of the eye, and look at what we call the ocular fundus. And the ocular fundus is everything that you see when you look through that keyhole at the back wall of the inside of the eye. And in particular, that's the retina and the optic nerve. Now, <clears throat> I thought, uh, in view of the fact you wanted a clinical perspective, I, I thought it'd be interesting to give you a historical perspective to go alongside that. And um, I guess many of you will recognize what this is, but this is an ophthalmoscope, a direct ophthalmoscope. And, and this was invented by von Helmholtz in 1851. And actually, until this was invented, it wasn't possible to look through that dark keyhole and look at the back of the eye. And, and so un, until people died and you could kind of look at the post-mortem eyes, you couldn't really see what was going on. So if people lost their sight, there was no way really to explain it in, in a, a large majority of cases. Now. The reason why I like to begin with this example is because von Helmholtz got the fame for this, but actually, it probably should have been Charles Babbage who got the fame for this. Now, of course, he, as we all know, he got a lot of recognition for his other contributions, but it turns out that <clears throat> von Helmholtz made the first uh, ophthalmoscope in 1851, but Babbage had a prototype ophthalmoscope four years prior to that. 
And I don't know if, if you guys will know this story, but what, what he did was <clears throat> he, he developed his prototype and he was very excited about it, I, I'm sure, and he sought out the most eminent eye surgeon in London at the time. And, and he went to this most senior, most well-respected, most eminent eye surgeon, and he, and he said, look, I think that this could be interesting, this thing that I'm developing, what do you think of it? And this, the eminent surgeon got it, and he sort of gave it a try, and then he sort of said, this is a load of rubbish, why are you wasting my time with this? It doesn't work, and even if it did work, what's the point? I don't need it. I don't, uh, and so Babbage, of course, then sort of put this, put this uh, aside, and von Helmholtz went on to develop the ophthalmoscope. Now, interestingly, and this is described in a historical piece in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, it turns out that the most senior, most eminent eye surgeon at the time that Babbage went to was really short-sighted. He was really myopic. And so he wasn't able to use the device at all that, he had been, that had been created. And his, in some way, maybe even on a subconscious level, his reaction was to trash it and not to see the potential of this device. Now, the reason why I love that uh, little story, and particularly to talk to an audience like this, is because to me it says, choose your clinical collaborators well, okay? <laughs> because they, they make a big difference. And, and, uh, and uh, one of the things that I like to think we're good at in more fields and, and, and trying to learn more about is how to be good clinical collaborators. Now, that was in the mid 19th century. And so then they went on, <clears throat> others went on to try not just to visualize the back of the eye, but how do we capture the images? And Jackman and Webster were the first people to try to um, image the back of the eye. And let me present to you the very first ocular fundus, the very first retinal image, um, at least on record. And so this, uh, it, this is the optic nerve, and this is just a big artifact in the image. So it didn't catch on at this stage. And uh, of course, one of the limitations, perhaps, is how do you illuminate the dark cave in order to be able to capture the image? And the options in the 19th century were somewhat limited. And at the time, what they had to do was get a candle and see how long they could basically get a candle as close to the person's eye as possible to try and illuminate things. So that was obviously a significant shortcoming of the, the, the clinical applicability of, the, of their uh, imaging system. Now, <clears throat> that all changed in the 1950s and the 1960s um, when you had um, you know, electronically timed flashes, you had very high quality 35 millimeter film, and you started to have the first clinically meaningful um, retinal cameras. And <clears throat> it's fair to say that led to a golden era, a 30 year golden era in ophthalmology, where for the first time people could figure out the commonest causes of blindness, macular degeneration, diabetic eye disease, and the like. <clears throat> oh, and that technology <clears throat> has continued to improve. And so now we have, we've moved from film to digital. We've increasingly got cameras that can take good images even if the pupil is not dilated. They can do stereoscopic views. And, and as many of you will be aware, we can now get clip-on lenses for your smartphones. Things like Peak, the portable eye examination kit developed in the UK that allows you to use your smartphone as a fundus camera. So actually, if you've got one of these devices now, with no medical training whatsoever, you can actually, within seconds, get on somebody's fundus and be looking at their optic nerve and looking at part of their brain effectively. Now, and we see images like this. This is the retinal photograph. This is the optic nerve. This is the, the macula. These are the blood vessels. <clears throat> this is what we're seeing. Now, until about... 10 or 15, maybe 20 years ago, this was the state of the art. This was the chest x-ray, if you like, of the ophthalmology world. Now, while this plays an important role still in, in many settings, this is not the most important imaging modality in ophthalmology anymore. And in fact, the most important imaging modality, more than all other imaging modalities in eyes combined, is something called OCT. And OCT, <clears throat> is, for those of you not familiar, is, is a bit like an ultrasound, 
except in me instead of measuring the reflection or the echoes of sound waves, it measures the reflection of light waves. And it, it can measure time delays and amplitudes of, of reflected light over short distances because it, it does it using interferometry. The upshot is that it gives pictures of the human retina like this. This is a picture of my retina um, <clears throat> taken probably seven or eight years ago. And the great thing about this is the resolution is about five micrometers, give or take. So much higher resolution than a CT scan or an MRI scan. But even better, <clears throat> it takes a few seconds to do. So it typically take about one and a half seconds to acquire the scans, no exposure to ionizing radiation. Um, we can do it on a five-year-old or we can do it on a 95-year-old without any problems. And chances are, if you ever come to visit me in Moorfields and I'm giving you a tour and I'm like trying to impress you, I might get you to sit down and have an OCT scan of, done of your own eye and then send it to you afterwards. Now, how do we use it? Well, before I explain, the other thing to highlight is that it's not just two-dimensional images. We get three-dimensional scans and we take these dense raster scans and that allows us to create these volumetric images of the retina. So this is your macula here. And at the center of the macula, you're going to see a dip, which is your fovea. That's the point of your, most, your highest visual acuity. And we use it to diagnose things like diabetic macular edema, where we can see waterlogging or macular edema that is not really apparent with other imaging modalities. <clears throat> and we use it to diagnose things like wet, age-related macular degeneration. And AMD is something that I suspect many family members of people in the audience may be receiving treatment for AMD, because, uh, and you may not even know about it, but AMD is the single biggest cause of blindness in the UK, in Europe, in North America, and in many other countries around the world, by far. And in fact, nearly 200 people develop the blinding forms of AMD every single day just in England alone. Now, OCT has revolutionized the way we diagnose and manage these retinal diseases, but of course that comes with some challenges. <clears throat> and this is Moorfields uh, just across London where, where I'm a consultant. And as I said, we do more OCT scans than the sum of all other imaging combined, uh, ophthalmic imaging combined. And that's sort of good and bad, because uh, in some senses we're drowning under the number of OCT scans that we do. And we audit the number of OCT scans. <clears throat> and one of the last times that uh, we did this, um, <clears throat> uh, we were really surprised to see how many OCT scans we do. And bearing in mind that these are high resolution, three dimensional scans, before I tell you, can you even imagine how many we would do per day, per week, et cetera? Well, let me tell you, we now do more than 1,000 OCT volume scans per day at Moorfields. So that's a huge amount of data that we as clinicians struggle to be able to make meaningful decisions, clinical decisions about. <clears throat> that number is going up all the time. Now, the caveat to that is that's imaging both eyes for each patient. So it's half the number of patients. The other thing is Moorfields has a number of sites around London, so I'm sort of, I'm always going to tell you the largest number possible. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a huge amount of data that we're producing. And in fact, we probably have more than 3 million uh, macular OCT scans now at Moorfields. Now, another problem that we face is this. And this is the high street. And <clears throat> one of the issues is that um, OCT increasingly is being used in opticians, whether you go to Specsavers or you go to Costco or Vision Express or Boots or an independent optician. Basically, when people go to have their eye check done, they are often offered, can, if, do you want to pay a little bit of extra money and have an OCT scan done? Check you for diabetic eye disease, check you for glaucoma and other things. Now, <clears throat> let me be clear. Overall, that is a really good thing, I think, if it, allow, if it can be used to allow earlier detection of these diseases. However, it does lead to a large amount of false positive referrals to eye, hospital eye services within the NHS. And so the analogy I would, I would use is it's as if, um, imagine if every GP in the country was given an MRI scanner, 
and told that they could do it and it would take two seconds on every person who comes in with a cough or a headache. But they weren't given a lot of training on how to interpret the scans and they just simply referred every patient into the NHS. Think about the problems that would cause. So as an example of that, in 2016, and this is even before OCT scans were widely adopted in the high street, um, we had, at Moorfields, we had 7,000 urgent referrals, new patient referrals, as possible wet AMD. And the Royal College of Ophthalmologists says that if you're referred, and, the, and they, on the referral it says possible wet AMD, you must be seen and treated within two weeks. Now, the problem we face at Moorfields and around the country and around the world is that oh, of those 7,000 referrals, only 800 of those actually had wet AMD. And the upshot is that a lot of those patients didn't get seen and treated uh, in a timely fashion. So, you know, that has huge implications for irreversible visual loss in those patients. Now, uh, and this is just an example of uh, an announcement from Specsavers um, in 2017, where they say they were going to roll out OCT across all 740 of their practices in the UK. Now, Specsavers do 9 million eye examinations per year in the UK. So you can imagine what the implications are of that if it increases our false positive referral rates even by 5%. And this is also said against one last little bit of um, trivia that I'll give you about this, is this. Ophthalmology surpasses orthopedics in annual attendance figures. So in 2017, NHS Digital released this information to say that ophthalmology is the biggest medical specialty in the UK in terms of clinic appointments, outpatient clinic appointments, and it overtook orthopedics in this regard. This regard. And so I love this stat because people think that ophthalmology is some sort of niche specialty. Well, actually, nearly 10% of all outpatient appointments on the NHS are for eyes, and that number is growing all the time. So all of this preamble is just to kind of like tell you this is, uh, I think, really fertile territory for advanced medical image analysis, for deep learning, for AI, whatever you want to call it. And so with that being the case, in July 2016, Moorfields announced this collaboration between uh, the NHS Trust and, and with Google and with DeepMind. Now, in actual fact, we announced it in 2016, but it began with a, with a message that I sent to Mustafa Suleiman in about July 2015. And so, actually, what, what happened was, and, and some of you will have heard this story before, but what happened was <clears throat> I had been reading a profile in Wired magazine about uh, DeepMind. And essentially, part of the interview was with, uh, with Mustafa, and he said, um, you know, we're interested in applying AI to healthcare, climate change, energy consumption, all of those things. And so that was when the light bulb went off in my mind to say, actually, this is a problem. Deep learning could be applied to OCT scans and to the triaging of OCT scans. And so I tracked down um, Moose's profile on uh, LinkedIn and, uh, and I sort of, I, I, I paid for like one month premium subscription to LinkedIn just so I could send him a message without being connected to him. And, and the message I sent him was something like, um, you know, I'm a consultant at Moorfields. We do 1,000 OCT scans per day. Uh, you know, we're two stops away from you on the tube. Uh, we should apply deep learning to these scans. And so my timing was good. And so that led to me meeting him just a few days later and initiating this collaboration. Now, <clears throat> what was interesting was, um, when I went in to see him, <clears throat> I'll never forget it because um, for, you know, for a, clinici a typical clinician, <clears throat> going into, the, into a different world like the tech world is a different experience. You know, we're used to NHS hospitals, maybe university environments, but it's sort of different to find yourself in the headquarters of Google and you know, talking to someone that you've just read about in a magazine. And, and I remember speaking to him and saying, oh, getting excited as I, as I, as I am prone to, and, and saying, like, we've got all these OCT scans, but, you know, we should do this, and blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, well, um, how many OCT scans do you have in total? And I went, well, we do 1,000 a day. We've got this. And, and he said, well, you know, how many in total? And I didn't really have a good answer to that. 
And he said, um, you know, uh, what labels do you have? What proportion of those do you have labels for? You know, and I said, well, we've got loads of labels. I'm sure we've got loads of labels. You know, we've got an electronic health record. We can label a large number of these. I'm sure we've loads of labels. He said, well, um, what are the file formats of these OCT scans? Is this a proprietary file format? Is this something we can have in an open source format? Or actually, do you just have these all like printed out on paper somewhere? And, um, and, and so, so actually, I didn't really have good answers to that either. Um, and, and then he said, well, and what are the ethics approvals that are required? What's the information governance that's required? What are the you know, contractual aspects of sharing this data you know, between an NHS trust and um, you know, an industry partner such as uh, DeepMind? And so <clears throat> let me tell you, I went away from that meeting like excited, but also like having to try and find out a lot of answers to these questions. And actually, it took me six months to a year, at least, to begin to answer those questions. And let me tell you, without wanting to blow, blow my own trumpet too much, in my experience, if you, if you ask clinicians those questions, nine times out of 10, they'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll be back to you in, in, a, in a week's time with the answers, and then you never hear from them again, because they're not able to get the answers to those questions, because it's such a challenge to find those answers. And so when we have an the answers to all those questions, we then go into a, a situation where we, we can put a data sharing agreement in place <clears throat> and share these OCT scans. And so it was in 2016 then when we could actually formally announce the collaboration. And uh, we, we ended up sharing probably a little over 1 million OCT volume scans. And these were all historical, anonymized OCT volume scans to begin this uh, research collaboration. Now, <clears throat> of course, we recognized from a very early stage that um, uh, this was potentially a sensitive topic because this is sharing NHS data with an industry partner. And you know, there's a lot of thought that really needs to go into doing that in an appropriate and thoughtful way. And so one of the things that we did was that there's a, a section of the Moorfields website which is dedicated to the Moorfields DeepMind collaboration and still there if you want to check it on your computers. Um, <clears throat> and so we put that up from the start. And there's a video of like, myself and my boss, uh, Sir Peng Ko, uh, talking about the collaboration, explaining why we're doing it, what it is, etc. And then it has <clears throat> questions and answers, such as, do patients have to give their consent for their data to be used? Well, in this case, it was retrospective, anonymized OCT scans, so actually, yeah, the patients don't have to give their consent for these anonymized OCT scans to be used. However, if you click on that link, what we do say is, if you want to opt out of this research, here is the email address of our information governance officer. You can contact us to opt out of the research. Now, of course, you can only opt out up to the point where we share anonymized data, because once we've shared an anonymized OCT scan, we, by definition, we don't have a way to re-identify that scan. So we can't, you can't opt out, you can't after the fact. But you can opt out and uh, any future uh, data sharing uh, with industry partners such as DeepMind. And we incorporate local opt-outs, but since 2017, we also incorporate the national opt-outs from NHS Digital as well. And the last time I checked, it's, uh, I think it was nine or maybe 10 patients or in the last uh, three or four years who have contacted Moorfields to opt out of the research. Now, none of those patients have actually had an OCT scan done at Moorfields, um, so somewhat of a moot point, but, but nonetheless, it's something we take really, really seriously, and we recognize that it's important for us to gain the trust of people by, by doing things the way we, we would want them to be done if we were sort of watching uh, you know, from our homes, from our sofas, etc. <clears throat> Another thing that we did that I think is quite nice is that uh, before we had done any sort of science, we published this uh, article in an open source peer reviewed journal just saying what we were going to do. Now, in fairness to us, or in fairness, it, it's pretty broad. It's just essentially saying we will apply machine learning to 
um, you know, anonymized OCT scans for the diagnosis of these retinal diseases. But we think that's a nice thing to do, um, you know, and really making every effort to be as transparent as possible about the plans for the, the collaboration. The other thing that I think is really important <coughs> is that the research has been really patient-centered from the start. And so this is a patient of mine from Moorfields um, called Elaine Manna. <coughs> and Elaine has wet AMD. And she, to me, exemplifies the reason for doing this in one person, the reason, why, the reason that motivated me to contact uh, DeepMind. So Elaine lost her sight completely in her left eye more than 10 years ago from wet AMD before there was any good treatment for the condition. And in 2012, 2013, she started to develop sight loss in her good eye. <clears throat> she, and at this point, there's now a good treatment for it. And she goes to her optician. Optician says, I think you're developing it in your good eye. Here's an urgent referral to a hospital eye clinic in the NHS. And she gets an appointment six weeks later. Now, imagine a situation where you're losing the sight in your good eye and you're told you need to wait six weeks for an appointment. And if that was my mother, I would realistically, being honest, I'd probably like her to be seen within six days. And, and so this, for me, is the promise of deep learning on OCT scans to triage these sorts of images so we can get um, people like Elaine in front of people like me at the earliest possible time. Because all of our evidence shows that if we intervene early, we can actually stop uh, blindness in these patients. So we've had a lot of patient focus groups, patient engagement events. And then when we announced the collaboration, we had brilliant support from the major eye disease charities, such as RNIB, Fight for Sight, the Macular Society, et cetera. <clears throat> so all of this is, I mean, I've, I've taken probably half my time talking about the basis for this. But I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have uh, to be doing this for real-world clinical applications and how important it is for all of this work that you put patient and public involvement and engagement at the center of everything that you do. Uh, and it's, it, you know, particularly when we're dealing with issues of large data sets and NHS data sets and the sensitivities around that, you have to be doing the right thing for the right reasons. Now, well, with all that being the case, it certainly, you know, was a, a seems like a long process where we go through it, but uh, it was so exciting then in August of, of 2018 when we finally published, well, not, I shouldn't say finally, it's not that long a time period, but um, uh, when we published our article that George mentioned in Nature Medicine. And one of the things I would highlight here is there are, I think there's 34 different co-authors on this paper, and that to me reflects the fact that this was a real research collaboration. So you've got amazing scientists from uh, DeepMind, like Olaf Ronneberger, who you'll all know, <clears throat> Jeff Defoe, and others. Who, um, you've got you know, a lot of clinicians from Moorfields, myself, Adnan Tufail, Kathy Egan, Peng Ko, and others. And then you've got other scientists from UCL. So a real research collaboration. This was very much not a case of you know, NH NHS trust, uh, industry uh, partner, here's the data, come back to us in three years' time with a, with a finished product. This was, uh, this was a collaboration uh, that was closely involved all the way through. And I would say a mark of a good clinical collaborator is not just someone who is sitting on some data, not just someone who says AMD is a bad thing, but someone who can actually help sort of steer the research, who can help um, define new use cases, novel applications, you know, and, and really begin to sort of at least get some sort of conceptual model of, of the advances that people like you are making in the, in the latest uh, uh, you know, technical approaches and just think about how those things could be used in a, in a healthcare setting. Now, <clears throat> it was a great honor then, after all that effort, that it was not just in Nature Medicine, it was on the cover of Nature Medicine, and then, of course, this being AI, you can't escape the hype around it. And so, you know, we got a, sort of a lot of media attention. And, you know, you can see this computer diagnosis could save side of millions, front of the evening standard. 
you can, you can imagine how excited my parents were to, to see that, and my parents in, in, in Ireland, and, uh, and the amount of like obnoxious sharing by my mother on Facebook of this sort of stuff, um, which is cool, which is really exciting, but also a little bit awkward, because let, let me tell you, being blunt, it has not saved the sight of even a single person yet, because the paper we've described is a proof of concept study on retrospective data, and we're still, only, we're still working on the processes to actually robustly clinically validate it and make this something that can be used in clinical practice. So of course, uh, you know, we have to sort of marry our enthusiasm for these new technologies with a sort of like uh, cautious optimism or, a you know, maybe a, even a little bit of skepticism about some of these things also. So don't email me saying, can you come to Moorfields and see the AI in action, which I do commonly get after I give these talks. Now, what did we do? Well, we created um, a neural network framework where we uh, essentially have two neural networks in series. Um, <clears throat> and we start with the, the digital OCT scan. And by the way, we, sh we use three-dimensional models. So we're not just doing, you know, applying the, the networks to like individual OCTB scans, but to, to three-dimensional models. And we feed it in first to a segmentation model that's been trained with about just under 900 um, painstakingly manually uh, segmented OCT volumes. That create, creates this tissue segmentation map, which is fed into a classification network, <coughs> excuse me, fed into a classification network, which is trained with about 15,000 uh, OCT volumes with classification labels. And then the output of that is a referral suggestion and a diagnosis probability. And so, <coughs> Because of our original use case that began with that initial message on LinkedIn, our primary outcome was, could it make the right triage decision? Urgent referral, semi-urgent referral, et cetera. <clears throat> but also then as a secondary sort of thing, can it look at about 10 different morphologic features on the OCT and say whether they're present? And we tried to get pretty much all the big hitters that a retinal specialist an ophthalmologist like myself would look at looking at the scans. So the sort of stuff that excites me, possibly a little bit less so for, for you, but choroidal neovascularization, macular edema, full thickness macular hole, partial thickness macular hole, drusen, epiretinal membrane, geographic atrophy, central serous retinopathy, uh, all of those good things. Now, <clears throat> uh, a really nice, now the reason we chose not to have an end-to-end -end approach uh, well, there's a couple of reasons for it, but one of the nice byproducts of that rationale is that we get a lot of segmentation output. And we, so this is already like two orders of magnitude better than anything that's uh, commercially available on the software of the OCT devices. So we can get the intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, we get 15 different parameters and we can get quantitative information. And so if our algorithm did nothing else apart from just giving that information to ophthalmologists when we're monitoring patients, that would be a massive, massive step forward for the field of retinal diseases and ophthalmology. <clears throat> now, the other thing that I should highlight is that we've trained it on more than 50 different retinal diseases. So we pretty much did all the retinal diseases that would have a macular OCT scan at Moorfields, and so it can make an urgent referral when there's this thing called choroidal neovascularization, but it, it, can, it can sort of um, make that referral if it's due to AMD or if it's due to myopia or if it's due to a range of different uh, diseases. And in fact, the only retinal diseases that we excluded was that if we had certain very rare diseases where there was only a small number of those in more fields, we did not share those because we had agreed with our information governance team that the, to limit the risks of re-identification, if you're the only person at Moorfields with this disease X, then we wouldn't share that data, just to be careful on the information governance side. And <clears throat> here's a picture of the prototype OCT viewer. So we start with the, OC, the 3D raw data, create this tissue segmentation map, and then for each of the disease features, we create a heat map. So here you can see 
the OCT scan that's fed in with the segmentation. This, you can't read it, but this says fibrovascular pigment epithelium detachment, where we can see the vascular tissue growing under the retina. This is subretinal fluid around it. It says choroidal neovascularization 99.5% and recommends urgent referral. Another thing which I'll say to you is that we, we, we use an ensemble approach. So there's multiple networks doing the segmentation and then multiple networks doing the classification decision. And for me as a clinician, that feels like I'm getting a second opinion from five different retinal experts. And in the majority of cases, they'll agree unambiguously, but in those challenging cases, we can kind of get a sense that they're challenging just because of that uncertainty. Here's a video showing this is a patient, a young, young person with diabetes, poorly controlled, and it doesn't take a retina specialist to see that their retina is completely so, uh, soggy with fluid, with macular edema. We've got this retinal thickness map, a map of the intraretinal fluid. Again, this is not available on any commercial OCT devices. It says macular edema 98.5%, and in this case, it recommends a semi-urgent referral. Now, here's an example for retina specialists. Um, and what's exciting to me is that this is a case which shows the, the, the fact that our, our algorithm does multi-class classification. So I won't bore you with the, the stuff that excites me, but suffice to say, the algorithm is thinking that this is choroidal neovascularization and is also thinking it could be something else called central serous retinopathy, which is a kind of benign condition versus a more serious condition, but ultimately it recommends urgent referral. What's interesting is that this is a patient who has got CSR sec with secondary CNV formation. And that's something that probably the majority of ophthalmologists would be incorrect when they would make a diagnosis on something like this. Now, let me show you an example of an error. And this is from the supplementary material of our paper. This is a case where the ground truth is normal, but the algorithm is wondering about a partial thickness macular hole, and it recommends an urgent referral, or no, a routine referral. And what you can see is that the, the, the quality of the OCT is a little bit poor, and that has led to an erroneous segmentation of the retina. And so this is, I think, helpful for us, this interpretability aspect, because you could imagine a situation where you know, the world's best AI system is telling you that if someone has got a disease and you need to give them an injection into their eye, and you're looking at it going, um, looks OK to me, but like maybe I'm stupid, maybe I'm missing something, and what am I going to be sued if I get the wrong answer here and if I don't, if I override the system? So we think interpretability is really important. And particularly the flip side is maybe the algorithm will get the right answer for the wrong reasons. And we need to have some awareness of that as clinicians. Now, how did we evaluate the algorithm? Um, we got 1,000 new patients at Moorfields who had a macular OCT scan at first presentation. And we basically, which was completely independent from the, the training and validation sets, and we ran the algorithm on those 1,000 cases. And um, basically, this is the errors on the referral decision. And it had a 5.5% error on the referral decision. We then got eight human experts. Experts one to four are uh, consultant retina specialists at Moorfields, some of whom have more than 20 years of experience. And experts five to eight are optometrists at Moorfields with much more limited experience in looking at these scans. And so how do you think that they did when they looked at those 1,000 cases? Well, <clears throat> not as well as the algorithm. And in fact, the algorithm did better than all eight human specialists except for the top two, where it did better, but it wasn't statistically significantly better. However, one thing to say is that this is not fair to the human experts. Because in these triage situations, the human experts would never have the OCT alone. They would typically have a retinal photograph. They would have a visual acuity. They would know the age of the patient. They might even also have a line or two of, of history from the patient. And so it's not fair if we ask them to do something that they don't do in their real clinical practice. So we repeated this, and we gave all of that information to the humans. And in fact, that did make their performance a lot better. And the best human expert got down to 5.5%, which was the same as the algorithm using the OCT alone. And let me tell you, these are people who are like world famous in the field of ophthalmology for diagnosing these things. <clears throat> 
the type of people that if you had a, if nobody knew what was going on with you, you would be sent for a second opinion to more fields to see one of these people. Now, what did it get wrong? Well, I won't go into the details um, too much for now, but what the BBC picked up on is AI did not miss a single urgent case. And in fact, you may say, well, what, how, why did these world famous experts have a 5.5% error rate? Well, it turns out that a lot of the things that the, the best experts had wrong were ambiguous cases or challenging cases where actually maybe it was our grand truth that was wrong and, or it was at least arguable. Now, what's interesting, that held for the best human experts, but it also held for the algorithm. And, you know, you, there's so many times where I've had to sort of, like, almost embarrassed, speak to someone like Jeff Defoe and go, actually, remember that grand truth I, I told you that we spent so long coming up with? Actually, we made a mistake, and the algorithm is probably right, uh, and we were wrong in the first place. And this is, by the way, this is me pretending to examine one of my patients, Elaine, with uh, AMD. Now, <clears throat> what about other OCT systems? Well, we trained it for the most part on TopCon, but we also wanted it to generalize to Heidelberg and Zeiss and other OCT systems. And the way we set it up was that we, when we trained it on TopCon, when we then immediately fed in a Heidelberg scan to the system, to the original segmentation and classification network, the system doesn't really know what it's looking at. And so actually it's got a 50% error rate. It's just a mess basically here. Now the nice thing about the way we set this up, the way that uh, Olaf and Jeff had, had framed this, was that we could retrain on a small number of segmentations, about 100 segmentations from a Heidelberg device, keep our original classification network, and now we're down to a 3.4% error rate. And so we think that that's going to be really important as, so that we don't have to wait for like thousands or hundreds of thousands of new scans to, develop, to, be, to be acquired any time we move to a new system. And of course, there are other approaches to solving this problem uh, as well. Now, where do I think that this could help? I think this could really help in things like medical education, aside from the clinical use cases I've already described. And one of the books that I've recently enjoyed a lot is, um, is this one from Gary Kasparov. <clears throat> and what's interesting was after he lost to Deep Blue, um, the last chapter of this book, he talks about chess players now, young chess players, they typically train using chess computers. And that has had a couple of uh, knock-on effects. Apparently, one is that you have more grandmasters at an earlier age than before, and you have a wider geographical distribution of grandmasters than before. And I think a large part of that is related to being able to use these powerful tools to help in your education. Now, I could easily imagine a tool such as this could help someone be as good at OCT interpretation as I like to think I am in a fraction of the time that I've spent to learn what I've, what I've uh, learned. Now, <clears throat> just in my last, because uh, I know uh, I don't have a lot of time left, my last few slides just to tell you uh, where we're at with this and then tell you a little bit about some other uh, AI-assisted science projects we're doing. One of the things that I've come to learn is that there's a big difference between a cool demo or a paper in a journal and actually something scalable, deployable. And it, you know, as a clinician, to be honest, we think that like the algorithm that you publish in your paper, that we're good to go. All the hard work is done at that point. And actually what I've learned in the last year or so is that is far from the truth. And so it was really exciting then that we've been able to work on the technical maturity of the algorithm. And in March of this year at the Crick Institute, we presented a, a sort of rewritten version of the algorithm that uses a cloud-based API where we were actually able to run the algorithm in a fraction of the time, in a fraction of the, with a fraction of the computing power, and we did it live on stage at Wired Health. And so that was, um, that was a tremendously exciting thing that we were able to do, and a big step towards something that we can use in clinical practice. Now, <clears throat> I do think that it's really important that we recognize that it's one thing also to have a retrospective proof of concept. It's another thing to get really good clinical validation. And so this is just a paper uh, related to uh, an FDA-approved diabetic retinopathy screening software, the first autonomous system uh, uh, approved by the FDA. And the diagnostic, this is a remarkable achievement, but the diagnostic accuracy they report in a prospective clinical trial 
was quite a bit less than the, the results from their retrospective studies. And I think we're going to see a lot of that as we move to proper clinical trials. And another thing that I would highlight as well is the experience from mammography, from decision support tools in the past, where actually diagnostic accuracy doesn't always equal clinical effectiveness. So you could have a really accurate system, and actually you find out like 10 years later that the outcomes in patients are not as good as you might think. And so we think that we can implement this in lots of new pathways in care. This is the, the, the new hospital that Moorfields will be building in King's Cross in 2021, on the high street and potentially even in the home. And the last couple of slides, I, I, I spent too long talking about uh, like uh, patient public engagement and ophthalmology at, uh, and, and why ophthalmology is so important at the start. But just to tell you, uh, briefly mention a couple of things which are one of the nice byproducts of this collaboration between Moorfields and DeepMind and, and Google is that we now have a lot of the technical infrastructure in place at Moorfields, at least in an embryonic form, to really begin to aggregate and curate our data in a meaningful way for machine learning. And we're beginning to work to transfer that to the cloud, supported by guidance from NHS Digital, saying that cloud services for NHS uh, data is something that is a good uh, thing to explore, subject, of course, to a lot of information security and data protection uh, caveats. And then the last cool thing that I just want to mention to you, because I'm hoping I'd love to come back in a year or two and tell you more about it, is a study that we've done called ALSI, where we've actually linked all our OCT scans to NHS Digital HES data, hospital episode statistic data. So we're in the process of finding out every patient who's had a retinal scan at Moorfields who's gone on to develop Alzheimer's, had a heart attack, had a stroke, et cetera. And you can only begin to imagine the potential of deep learning and other machine learning approaches to interrogate that data and to go from the eye to the rest of the body. And so an example of that from Google Brain is that you could predict your age to within three years from a retinal photograph. And even more bizarrely, for a retina specialist, you can say whether it's a man or a woman from a retinal photograph with very high accuracy using deep learning. And let me tell you, as a retinal specialist who spent 15 years looking at obsessively at retinal photographs, I cannot begin to tell whether it's a man or a woman from a retinal photograph. And you can even predict whether the refractive error of the images. So I can tell how powerful your glasses should be to quite an accurate level using deep learning on a retinal photograph alone. So for, believe me, for ophthalmologists, these are astounding kind of revelations um, for this field. So, okay, well, I was going to briefly mention the future of healthcare and how this uh, impacts on things. And I'm sure people have seen the site, willrobotstakemyjobs.com and enter your job, well, <laughs> physician or surgeon, I like to think that we're safe, but of course, who, who knows about these things? But, um, and um, they say we're totally safe. Um, and I, I would make the point that um, I don't think that I can't really ever envisage, at least any time in my lifetime, a situation where your smartphone or your smartwatch tells you you're going to go blind or tells you that you have a malignant tumor and you're, you're going to die, essentially. And I do think that human interaction is going to be always a requirement, no, how, no matter how advanced our technologies are. And the high value skills in the future are going to be related to communication, empathy, creativity, all of these good things. Having said that, one of my colleagues, who's an ophthalmologist from uh, Swansea, said to me, that sounds good, but like, do you, um, does that just mean you want somebody who can give you a hug and then the AI tells you that like this is the diagnosis? And, and he said to me, um, I, I don't want to be a designated driver for a driverless car. Now, I don't think that that's the case either because actually what I would say in the long term, I think the field is going to move beyond like image classification tasks. And we're, in ophthalmology, we've got multiple psychophysical tests, multiple imaging modalities. We're going to have multiple omics data. And I would see five years from now, 10 years from now, the role of the clinician 
will be to integrate all of those modalities using deep learning or whatever other techniques are around, and then combine that with all those aspects of, of empathy and wisdom and communication and the like. So my last slide, before George drags me, uh, drags me off, is where are the next steps with this? Well, robust clinical validation is going to be key. So combine our enthusiasm with caution before we unleash things in patients. I think AI-assisted science and getting new insights from images is going to be really exciting. Um, nice paper in Nature Medicine in the last few days uh, looking at gastroenterology and just really mind-blowing the insights that we can get if we, do, if we apply these things to the right problems. And, and if I haven't convinced you before now, I, I'll end by saying, you know, ophthalmology will be the first medical specialty to be fundamentally transformed by uh, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc. And if you want to learn more or if you want to come to more fields and have a chat, that's my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the really fantastic talk. Um, we're going to open the floor for questions. There's a question here at the front. So th thank you very much for the uh, very insightful talk. So I have a couple of questions. I'm here. Yeah. But I'll, I think I'll ask one because we don't have many much time. Uh, so you talked about retrospective data collection. Yeah. Uh, we all know that deep learning is data driven. So data can depend on population, on geographic region, on mm -hmm. uh, age groups, even time and seasons. So could you perhaps maybe provide uh, some insights on how to continuously integrate the uh, training pipeline to encounter the variability uh, into the model training, the mm -hmm. data variability, basically? So um, I'm not sure if I necessarily have um, you know, insights on the technical aspect. Um, <clears throat> I, I would just comment in regard to OCT scans. A nice aspect of them compared to retinal photographs is there isn't that much difference, there isn't as much difference in different ethnicities and, and, and things like that. And a further nice point about Moorfields is that, and, and being in London, is that you know, we are one of the largest eye hospitals in the world, and we have just such a heterogeneous population. So we have... Um, the full spectrum of different ethnicities. We have the full spectrum of disease severities. We've got many different OCT devices acquired by many different technicians and photographers with different levels of skill. So I'm sort of already confident that the data that we have will generalize nicely. Having said that, it's one thing for me to feel on a gut level that it will work. It's another thing to prove it. And so what we're interested in now is can we can we, so from my perspective, can we set up clinical studies to say, if you're someone from Ghana with diabetic macular edema who comes to more fields and has an OCT scan, will you get the same output if you, as if you go to Accra and you have the same OCT or a similar OCT scan done? And, and so setting up those clinical studies is, is really my focus now. Also at the bottom. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for the thank exciting you. talk. And uh, also, thank you for sharing your experience yeah. in this kind of collaborative yeah. uh, studies and research. Yeah. Uh, we are in, a, in that journey as well at the moment. Okay. Yeah. But one thing you hinted at towards the end, which is really an urgent issue, I don't think that is really sort of properly addressed, is how this AI system eventually going to be used mm. in the clinical setting. For mm. example, if you are a consultant yeah. Yeah. and you have such a brilliant system in yeah. your clinic, how you are going to use this? Yeah. And uh, what would be the regulators will say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's an important point. Now, the thing is that we have a, a very specific use case in mind in the first instance, which is, um, you know, this triaging use case. And in fact, there are pathways that have been established in the NHS where we have rapid access virtual clinics where people come in and have an OCT scan and leave, and a human expert looks at the scans within 24 hours. So we could easily imagine the algorithm going into that uh, setting, you know, pretty quickly. Now, of course, what we, 
there's many applications that you, so you could imagine a retina specialist using it to monitor their patients, uh, or you could imagine non-ophthalmologists using it in some way. But of course, we need to be cautious in that regard because we also need to provide sort of separate evidence for some of those things and consider what regulatory approvals ultimately we have which define the different use cases. There's another question here at the front. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, thinking toward, asking the question in a slightly different way towards yep. maximizing clinical impact. Yep. Um, do you have any suggestions of things that, on the data collection or study design uh, to increase the likelihood of having the largest clinical impact and the least amount of decay from uh, your, your retrospective data to doing prospective uh, mm. work? Um, so I, I'm not sure. Um, but I think um, anything that we can do, suppose in ophthalmology, anything that we can do that can increase the digital maturity of eye hospitals around the UK or potentially around the world, so that it's, it's much quicker and easier to get access to um, like anonymized OCT data sets from different hospitals so that we can do, do much more continuous validation of the algorithm. That, that seems to be the most important thing. Um, I would say in general as a non-computer scientist, non-engineer, the thing that I'm starting to feel strongly is that, uh, is that sort of cloud-based applications in healthcare are going to be really important. And so as we see the NHS moving towards uh, more use of the cloud just for clinical care, but also for research applications, I feel that's when we'll really supercharge all of these things. There's a question in the middle at the back. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if there was an ablation study done that cuts out the segmentation part of your, uh, of your yeah. system because so you, I feel like you kind of bottleneck your system to agree with what humans think is yeah. important for the eventual yeah. uh, outcome. And I was yeah. wondering if you maybe uh, tried that. Yeah, so, uh, so I guess that's a, f that's a fair point. And I, and I think one of the reviewers raised that when we were publishing the, the paper. And, um, and of course, there is a concern that by doing something like this, we could de depreciate the performance of the algorithm as opposed to an end-to-end -end approach. Um, uh, we did repeat some of the, some of the studies using uh, an end-to-end -end approach. And I think that, as far as I remember, the results were already so good using the two neural network approach that we didn't really get any appreciable, uh, any clinically meaningful bump up from doing it in, a, in an end-to-end -end way. Hi, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, I find it interesting you use dark blue letters on a black background as an so, ophthalmologist because yeah. humans can't read it, so, but anyway. So just, um, <laughs> that's, no. No, that's not me. That's not me. That's oh, not okay. me. So, so, that's, so this is what happens when you convert Apple Keynote into, uh, into Microsoft PowerPoint for the presentation. Um, so this was and, not my question, and, actually. It was just a joke. But my and, and, and then always, like, and to be, honest, uh, to be honest, I probably could have f fixed it, but just I'm, I'm already kind of like at the last minute sending the slides and things like that. So somehow that falls under the radar a little bit. So apo but the, apologies for But the talk for... was fantastic. Thank oh, you so thank much. You, thank you. But um, I wanted to ask actually whether you have thought about how to bring these, this technology, let's say, to third world countries like Africa, um, yeah. where maybe people do not have a lot of money to buy yeah. a system like this. Yeah, so I think we have to be realistic as well. I mean, um, so interestingly, OCT is used a lot in Africa. And so, but it would be, so if you go to Nairobi or you go to Accra or you go to large uh, cities, there will be OCT devices. Uh, where it's not, of course, available is in smaller towns and things like that. And it, it probably is uh, at least a couple of years away before that realistically is gonna happen. Because the current devices could cost, the cheapest would probably be 20 or 30 grand. And the, the more expensive would be 150 grand. Um, but there is a lot of work on more portable uh, or even like handheld OCT devices that people are saying could cost as little as $350. Right. But who knows how long that'll take. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe one last question. Thank Hi. you very much for the interesting talk. Um, 
I'm interested in the evaluation performance. Yeah. So you showed that the model is outperforming uh, more than eight experts. Yeah. So can you comment on that? Uh, so yeah. are you saying that the model is able to capture features or signs which is the expert couldn't? And so if this is the case, which kind <coughs> of features? Have you studied the, these features which yeah. is uh, not visually probably uh, captured by the expert? So, um, so the two answers to that are, um, the first is what I didn't explain just because I'd, I'd I'd gone on so long talking about Babbage and von Helmholtz was um, the ground truth that we took for this was was not what the, the the physician would see in a rapid access triage clinic. The ground truth was when they get in front of a retinal specialist and they can have other invasive tests such as fluorescein angiography and like 10 other tests, they receive treatment and they're followed up for like a six month period if they were diagnosed with wet AMD at baseline with all the tests and then six months later nobody's changed their mind about it, that was our ground truth uh, diagnosis. So that's, that's the reason why, of course, the, you know, the experts weren't, weren't getting exactly the right, part of the reason they weren't getting the right answer. In answer to your second point, uh, for me, we're only beginning to scratch the surface of the next thing of like, um, I think there was a, a paper in, in Nature recently called uh, Machine Behavior. And this, this idea of um, leaving aside how it's got to the conclusions, like can we sort of empirically examine like why it's coming up with these things, how it will, uh, will, will we know that it doesn't work in circum circumstances, will it work in, well in others? And, and so I'm super interested in, in those aspects. And I feel like we've got like five years of like research plans that we want to carry out in that regard. Okay, just with that in mind, in, in, in the interest of time, let's just thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.